Tick tock, time to rock. Live from Tel Aviv. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? We are we are trying this. We don't really know if this is going to work, but we are here in the airport. We noticed that it had a pretty good internet connection, so we decided to go ahead and try to go live before we jump on our plane. Uh, if we run into any technical difficulties, we'll try to solve them very quickly. But uh, I happen to be here with uh, some of my friends that I was traveling through Israel with, and we had a major event happen um, while we're while we're touring Israel, and just happened to be here with an ex-Army Ranger and an ex-Navy SEAL. So, decided to get some thoughts on that. Now, I'll go ahead and read a little uh, story uh, about what happened with al-Baghdadi in case you haven't been following the news. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to get a quick introduction from these guys. Uh, first, why don't you give us uh, your military background real quick? Sure, since Rangers lead the way, it is only fitting <laughs> that I go before the SEAL. Hey guys, I am John Lovell. I am a fellow YouTuber, so... Power to the YouTubers. Oh right? yes, and I have a I have a link to his channel, Warrior Poet Society, in the description box. So, so if you you can subscribe if you if you want to run around with guns and go. It's basically all I do. You don't even have to check out Warrior Poet <laughs> channel because do it one more time. That's basically all I do. That's the whole channel. So if you're thinking you're missing something on the Warrior Poet channel, you're not. It's just me doing that. So uh, yeah. Anyway, and uh, Chad. Yep, Chad Williams, former uh, U.S. Navy SEAL, and uh, wrote a book called Seal of God. And I'm on YouTube as well, and uh, going to be getting some videos going a little bit more. But uh, the uh, the title of that is Divine Sabotage. If you guys ever want to check that one out, maybe we'll get that link in the description. Wait, what? Later. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, your channel's Divine Sabotage. Divine. Sabotage. Okay, I will, I will, cool. I will add that. I will add that uh, as soon as we're done. But I already put a link to your book in there. Very cool. Put a link to your book, Seal of Seal of God, in there. Okay, um, so. You guys are ex Army Ranger and ex Navy SEAL. Why'd you decide to go and do something different? Uh, sure. I, I personally got burned out on two things, and that was war of and the first parts of the war. Right when the towers fell, I was in airborne school, and then deployed with the 75th Ranger Regiment straight to Afghanistan, and then went back multiple times so I did five uh, tours total so anyway I just got burned out on more and had a lot of close calls and I felt like if I kept uh, pushing the envelope I was going to die and so I just had enough and so I, I'm less I'm not as much a military man I was rather just a man in the military and I personally kind of warrior poet ethos now warrior and poet I am more than just the military guy that was a season of life and now I've moved on and the other thing is just kind of bureaucracy that even in special operations units it just kind of climbed into and started dorking up our feng shui and so anyway uh, add enough silliness in some respects but not to not to cast any shadow or shade on Ranger Battalion it, I do it again an amazing amazing place to serve very proud to have that fraternity and uh, have done that but uh, look at this guy right here all right Chad why don't you step up so that we're uh, all sort of on the same level right. audio wise sounds good all right yeah so uh, I was in for about six years and halfway through that I you on one of those seal teams like seal team seal team seven seal team seven yeah and so there's just a, a real... seal team seven only way to heaven all right <laughs> it's because it rhymes so it, the number it's of completion be I see what you're it's doing too. right because it rhymes <laughs> Um, yeah, halfway through that though, uh, I just had this radical transformation. Uh, I became a, a Christian and it just really changed the trajectory of my future. I went from thinking that I was going to make a whole career out of being a SEAL to uh, kind of really looking forward to the opportunity to get involved in, in ministry and advancing the kingdom of heaven against that kingdom of darkness. And uh, in hindsight, also kind of realizing that everything in life, like my advice to guys is you know, maybe just do one or two enlistments because everything in life has its season and there's always like the younger generation that can step up. And uh, I've just seen how hard it is for guys to be uh, a great uh, teammate and a great husband and a great father simultaneously all at the same time. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great place uh, for single guys or guys that are just getting started uh, and then move on to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, um, Basically, just to give you a quick outline, we're, we're going to be getting on a plane uh, very soon. So we'll probably do a total of, of close to an hour here uh, live, assuming we don't have any technical problems and assuming no one uh, kicks us out or anything. Um, but basically what we want to do, I'll, I'll go ahead and read a uh, uh, 
quick uh, excerpt from uh, a BBC article on what happened with uh, al-Baghdadi. Then I'll ask these guys a little bit to explain how, how these things work, uh, you know, what, ha what happens, why, you know, because these are the kinds of guys who, who do things like that, not anymore. But I'll um, uh, we'll ask these guys about how the mil military works. But also, since these guys are both Christians, um, like to get their perspective, and we'll all share our perspectives on things like Christians and war and loving our enemies. And if we love our enemies, what do you do with people like al-Baghdadi and uh, stuff like that? So hopefully we can get all that in. Does that sound good? All right. So let me see if I can find this article real quick. All right. So guys, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button because that helps him out a lot. Yeah, hit the like button. We know you like it. How about that? See? YouTube experience. We're hooking <laughs> you up, brother. Look at that. All right, so here we go. This is from the BBC. Uh, <laughs> this one is about um, them using some stolen Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi underwear to do the DNA test, right? Because if someone, it's basically if someone comes along and says, hey, I know where Baghdadi is, they say, we want some DNA uh, to verify. So... That's uh, a bad day for that forensics guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait, you want me to swab? Gosh, this guy's been hiding in a cave for months and you want his underwear. Well, anyway. <laughs> finger, no, not a fingernail, not a hair from, a, from his comb or something, right? <laughs> no, underwear. You want underwear. All right. Uh, the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces have said their spy stole Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's underwear, which was then DNA tested and used to prove his identity before he was killed. A senior SDF commander claimed their source also played a vital role in tracking down the Islamic State leader's location before an operation by U.S. Special Forces in Syria. Baghdadi killed himself in the raid. U.S. President Donald Trump has downplayed the role of Kurdish forces. Um, skip through this. So, uh, well, I'll go and read it. When announcing the raid on 27th October, Mr. Trump said the Kurds provided helpful information but added that they had not carried out a military role at all. But Paula Khan insisted that SDF played an important part in the raid in a Twitter thread posted on Monday. All intelligence and access to al-Baghdadi, as well as the identification of his place, were the result of our own work. Our intelligence source was involved in sending coordinates, directing the airdrop, participating in, and making the operation a success until the last minute. Mr. Khan added that the SDF had been working with the CIA to track Baghdadi since 15th of May and had discovered that he was hiding in Idlib province where the raid took place. Let's see if I can uh, skip down to what exactly happened. Uh, okay, what do we know about the raid? This is what I was looking for. Several U.S. allies or powers in the region were given advance notification of the raid, including Turkey, Iraq, Kurdish forces in northeastern Syria, and Russia, which controls airspace over Idlib. The troops arrived to a barrage of shots on the ground, report said. On landing, the U.S. force called on Baghdadi, who had fled into a tunnel, to come out and surrender. The force blew holes in the walls to avoid any booby traps indoors. The retreating Baghdadi then detonated his suicide vest, killing himself and three, tr and three children in the tunnel. Mr. Trump said test results carried out on the remains gave certain immediate and totally positive identification that it was Baghdadi. The tests were carried out on site by technicians who accompanied the Special Forces personnel and had samples of Baghdadi's DNA with them, reports said. Um, so anyway, it goes on to talk about facial recognition technology and so on, and uh, basically that they know they got this guy. So any thoughts, first of all? Super stoked that uh, that guy is now a whole lot of much smaller parts of a guy. Really? And you're a Christian? <laughs> yeah. All right. We're going yeah, to we're have to figure this one out. Yeah, here. wax pretty, that dude uh, to the glory of God. Yeah. Devastating blow. Pun intended. Blow. Hey, dad joke. What's up? <laughs> you guys didn't know the special forces guys are all like total goofballs. Um, anyway. Well, we can laugh at his death. What I'm not stoked about is the children. That's... That, that is that, that is messed up. By, by the way, are you are you guys familiar with that sort of thing? Dudes that would take out like even like kids and women and stuff like that while while fighting. In one instance, over in Iraq, you know these guys that make suicide vests, oftentimes you know they're not the ones that want to wear it themselves, and they have such a difficult time finding somebody to raise their hand and volunteer to put it on. Uh, that I know one instance over there, they took two mentally handicapped women and actually strapped these vests onto them and shoved them off into a crowded marketplace as they watched from 
a distance like Howard setting it off with a, a remote. So kind of shows where uh, you know they're at in terms of cowardness. The so, lower level guys, it, it, it's easier to get them. And I don't know what, what the type of pressure they do to coerce the guys. Perhaps they're just truly religious zealots and that's their deal. Or perhaps, hey, if you don't do this kind of thing, we're going to do terrible things to your family. I don't know what the pressure is, but I did notice in kicking in who knows how many palace doors, doing raids on high value targets uh, and where they lived in their you know, pomp estates. Uh, those guys, the, uh, a lot of times the palaces would be filled with weapons and they would go down without any issue. I mean, like there's the gun and they refuse to pick it up and they have wives and kids in front of them as if to use them as shields. And so I saw, I saw that stuff. I didn't sit, what I expected before I ever went over was to meet a brave, you know, zealot for their faith. But a lot of the higher, higher up guys seem to be cowards uh, making other people do their dirty work. So I noticed that. I find it pretty interesting too. Like here he is, the their fearless leader, right? Yeah, and he's fearless. hiding behind children. Yeah, it's not like he uh, went and, and faced the guys that were coming after him. He's running, you know, yep. in a tunnel, finds himself in a dead end, yep. and uh, it's kind of symbolic. Yep. You know, he dies in a dead end, and that's kind of where he's led ISIS. So not only did he lead his family into a dead end. Uh, but that's where the Islamic State is as well, like in a dead end. That'll preach. That'll preach. That's good. <laughs> that's 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 warrior poet stuff too, man. Oh man, that's that's good. <laughs> that's strong. I mean, no, no. I'll never be called a poet. Hey, but... that's that's poetry. Man. That's now, now, question that's along those lines. Hypothetically, hypothetically, suppose you guys have Abu Bakr al Baghdadi cornered. Wait, they're about to do an announcement. <laughs> Anyone want to translate this for us in the chat? Because <laughs> he could be saying, hey, you three, get out of there. All right, guys, um, hypothetically, hypothetically, if you guys had... Um, and it's cool, guys. We have over a thousand, a uh, thousand people watching right now, and we kind of just put this together at the last second. But um, hypothetically, here, suppose you guys got Al Baghdadi cornered in a cave, and he says, "Guys, I'm sending three children out. They're back here. I don't want to blow them up. Just don't shoot while the kids come out. Then I'm going to blow myself up. What do you do?" Uh, I, tactically speaking, I think that we would back off. You don't have to go rushing into a room, especially with a guy wearing a suicide vest. And that's exactly what you'd want to do. Even if you didn't have kids, you want to try and call him out yeah. uh, from a distance. So j just to be clear, there's no there's no reason he had to die, right? If he'd have come out, hands up, what? Um, all American forces, like anybody I'd ever served with, would much rather those kids not die, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that's what you're asking. What about that's Baghdadi? What if he comes out, hands up? Yeah, dirt nap that dude. You are? Really? Well, you do no, it anyway? No, 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 no. <laughs> Look you at this. We caught you. You can't. We no, no, you. no, no, no. No, 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 no. Uh, he's got a suicide vest. Yeah. He's got a suicide vest. Yep. And he's got to go. Okay. And he's so got to go. If he comes out of the a cave in a suicide vest and you don't dirt nap that yeah, joker. Yeah, so you're, you're saying you would, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't let him out of there even hands up if he's got a suicide vest No, on. he's okay. shown lethal intent. He's okay. wearing a suicide vest moving toward us. But you're saying kids walking out, you pause and let the kids walk out. Of course. So we, there's no reason for those kids to die except for al-Baghdadi must have wanted them to to die with it. No, yay for Arab children and boo for ISIS scum. Mm -hmm. Dirt nap all those jokers. They're horrible. They're trying to kill innocent kids. Look, they just killed three of their own kids. Those men need to die immediately to very, the glory of God. Very narcissistic too, you know? I mean, taking his kids out. He could have sent his kids out, right? And I think the reality is he yeah. didn't want to face, he didn't want to face man's judgment. That's and good. so he thinks he's going to get out of this by pushing a button. When in reality, we know that by that push of the button, he's going to go face a much harsher judgment. That's right. wants for man to die, and then comes the judgment. And so mm -hmm. he's got fiery hell, not 70 virgins uh, waiting for him. Mm -hmm. And that's his consciousness right now. Yeah. yeah. And guys, if you haven't been following my videos throughout uh, all the time that I've been commenting on, on ISIS, basically uh, for years, news reports came out saying, well, these guys aren't, aren't really following the teachings of Muhammad and so on. And I would immediately go to the Muslim sources showing that this is exactly what uh, Islam teaches. Uh, he, he named himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi for a reason. 
for a reason. He's the Abu Bakr of, of Baghdad. Abu Bakr was Muhammad's closest friend in life. Um, and he was the one who, uh, he was the first of the rightly guided caliphs afterwards. But basically what you had uh, after Muhammad's death, a bunch, of pe uh, a bunch of Muslims tried to rebel and tried to uh, leave Islam, tried to, uh, decided that they don't have to follow uh, teachings like giving zakat and things like that. And Abu Bakr decided to clear war in, in order to cleanse the, the Muslim community of heresy and rebellion and all these things. And um, lots of Muslims in the world view this as something that was necessary to get Allah's blessing on the community so that they could go through their period of rapid expansion. So if you're in the world today and you're looking around saying, wait, why isn't Islam dominating the world? Um, you, you either have to think something like, it, well, it's because it's not true, or you would think from an Islamic perspective, maybe it's because uh, we are just, we're, we're compromised, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're allowing all sorts of sin in our community. What do we need in order to take over? We need to crack down on all sin and rebellion and establish a pure Islamic society. That's why he called himself the Abu Bakr of, uh, of Baghdad. He did what the original Abu Bakr did, right? Uh, so the idea that this isn't Islamic is, is just nonsense, but that's that's what that's what his goal was now Here's the thing I Already can tell what your guys's view are but uh, is but uh, what do you do with people like this as is your Christian, right? Yeah, I, I, and the reason I'm bringing this up and I'll probably make a separate video on this um, but when I would post on Facebook something like remember love your enemies I would get comments back like Oh, so you're saying if a man is raping my wife, I should just let him because I love him? And right there, I have no concept of what you mean by love, right? right. If that's what you mean by love. I would hate to see how you raise your children. If you think, oh, little Timmy's burning down the house, but I should let him because I don't want to interfere because I love him. And loving means I let him do all this horrible, uh, right. horrible stuff. Um, so how do you reconcile being a Christian and being commanded to love your enemies with saying, hey, this guy needs to take a dirt nap? I think the key to any text is always the context, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus in that same Sermon on the Mount where he says, you know, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that ye, you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. I think he's talking about people that are being evil towards Christians and persecuting them. Uh, he's not talking about, you know, fighting or war in that sense. And in other places where Jesus, in that Sermon on the Mount, he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Does he really want you to cut off your hand? Does he really want you to pluck out your eye uh, when it causes you to sin? Uh, but what we do have in the scriptures in Romans chapter 13, I think it's pretty clear cut. Uh, it talks about how the government does not bear the sword in vain, but we are to be a tear in the lives of those that want to commit evil and tear. And mm -hmm. so if you don't want to face the judgment from the government, if you don't want to face that sword, sword do what is good. Don't commit uh, what is evil. And mm -hmm. so I think that there's biblical justification for what we're doing overseas, mm -hmm. hands down. So, uh, just, guys, if you're not familiar with what he's talking about, uh, you don't just have a command to, to love your enemies. You, in, in the Bible, you also have uh, the claim that governments are instituted by God and that they, do, that, that, that they bear the sword for a reason to execute judgment on people who do really bad things. And there aren't many people in all of history who've done worse things than someone like uh, al-Baghdad. John, what are your thoughts? I think uh, context is key, and I think looking into the character of God is incredibly important as well. God himself, he says, I am a protector of the innocent and of the weak, and he talks about, I, I, you know, he marches out to battle like a mighty man of war, and remember, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So remember, Jesus will be in the fields of Megiddo, double-edged sword, stacking bodies, and so that's our Jesus. We also see God in the Old Testament as well uh, punishing the Israelites unto death because they refused to go kill people in the promised land. And so you see just a thread of a biblical theological necessity for violence. And it's just the nature of a fallen world where there's evil people that would like to slay the innocent. We need uh, we need God-ordained protectors to be able to rise up, and, and that, that's my heart. Now, also, the heart of God isn't just one protecting of the innocent. It's also not wanting the evil to perish, but repent and be saved. And I would love for ISIS to repent of horrible, horrible crimes, unspeakable crimes against humanity. I'd love for them to repent, but as it stands, if you'd like to kill my, uh, my countrymen, my family, or any innocent person, well... 
then we have a solution for those problems as well. But mm -hmm. I, I'd like repentance. I, I would mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, also, as far as uh, as far as I can tell, um, the love that we're commanded to have uh, doesn't have a lot to do with having warm, fuzzy feelings towards towards people. It seems to be uh, when you see a, a command to to love your enemies or things like that, it, it's it's connected to actions and, and things that you, you have control over. Like when Jesus says, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, can you always just, you know, have warm feelings about your enemies? Well, maybe not. Uh, can you pray for them? Yes, you can. You can pray for people who are persecuting you. You can sit down and say, hey, these guys are persecuting me. They're persecuting my family. They're persecuting my community, but I'm going to pray for them. Uh, so that is within that is within your control. Your feelings might not be. You might you might feel nothing but anger and rage towards these people, but you can still pray for them. Or when Paul says, "If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Uh, if he is thirsty, give him a drink." You know, this is a guy who's you know bullied you back in school or something. You finally see him, but he's you know he's poor and starving now. Um, can you have nice warm feelings about him? Well, that might not be under your control. What is under your control? Well, you can you can you can feed this guy. You can you can help him. So as far as I can tell, love is 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 less about some feeling and, and more about um, just wanting what's best for people and doing what, whatever you can that's best for people. And you, when, if you're dealing with someone like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, one, you're not just thinking about him, you're thinking about everyone who, whose lives he's destroying. Right? He's destroying lives. You love those people as well. You have, to, you have to protect those people as well, especially if you're a government trying to deal with that. Um, but two, even, even if you take someone like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, you know, it's easy to say this guy's a this guy's a this guy's a dirtbag. Guess what? I've been a violent dirtbag too. Right? People people still loved me, but that doesn't mean you let me get away with doing horrible horrible things. And so, with someone even with someone like Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, up until his dying breath, I, I I wanted what's best for him. Meaning, turn away from all that stuff. Go turn yourself in and face justice. That is that is what is best for him. But if he's not going to do that, if he refuses to turn away, guess what's best for him? It's best for him to to, to die. That's what's best for him, so that whenever he does face judgment, um, he's done less than he could have. You know what I mean? In other words, if a if a if a jihadi is about to blow a bunch of people up and you kill him and stop him, guess what? That wasn't just best for the people around there. That was best for him too, right? Because he was this guy was about to have a lot more blood on his hands. That's a good point. So, all right. Well, it's uh, ten fifty two. Maybe we'll take some questions. Any any further thoughts along these lines? Uh, I, I think another passage that sometimes people appeal to is uh, a, a faulty translation of what the Sixth Commandment is. Uh, they'll say, doesn't the, the Sixth Commandment say, thou shall not kill? And so what are you doing, you know, as a, as a Christian or a believer in God, killing people? Uh, when in reality, the word kill there is, is not kill. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's ratosh, it's murder. And there's a big difference between, you know, killing somebody and maliciously taking innocent life the way that al-Baghdadi did with his own children and thousands of other people as well. And so we're not murdering people. In fact, Ecclesiastes says there's actually a time to kill. And so this is all about being defenders of defenseless. I think that Romans 13 really is the gold standard text on the topic. But you could also see it in Jesus' teachings as well. You know, the first time he sent out his disciples, he sent them out with basically nothing. But the, the second time he sends them out, he says, look, I sent you out pretty much without a gear list. But this time I'm sending you like, you know, bring your sandals. What are sandals for? For walking on. He says, bring a money bag. What's the money bag for? For putting money in. Uh, bring a knapsack. What's the knapsack for? Uh, for putting your belongings in. And bring a sword. What's the sword for? People sometimes want to try and make that a metaphor then. I think the sword is for defending themselves. And so we're not trying to advance the kingdom by force. Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world, lest my servants would fight. But he's also telling them, you don't need to be a doormat to be walked on. A sword is for defending yourself. And so that's that's the principle right there. It's just like John said, it's the heart of God. Being a defender of the defenseless. Stand by for this important announcement in Hebrew. <laughs> Attention, please, all Jordanian passengers on flight 341 to Amman. Talk amongst Both yourselves, guys. City. Talk amongst Please yourselves. Do. Thank you. And guys, uh, again, if you're if you're just tuning in, we are we are here live from Tel Aviv in Israel. And uh, uh, for those of you who just tuned in, we uh, we noticed we had a, a decent internet connection here at the airport. We decided to go live, and amazingly, we we didn't really have any uh, we haven't had any technical problems. So. 
that's cool. Anyway, uh, again, if you're just tuning in, uh, I was here and have been touring Israel with my friends, former Army Ranger, former, former Navy SEAL, and thought we'd get uh, some uh, some commentary on the death of al-Baghdadi. Uh, guys, uh, what do you know about, like, who actually went in there and did this? You guys, Did you guys follow the story? You guys know who did this? It'd be a little bit more in your little house. It's Army. A, right? a, an unnamed unit out of Bragg that would, yeah, everyone knows who it is, but yet we can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Uh, There's an airline named after him. Not really, but <laughs> spirit <laughs> frontier. I don't know. Spirit force. That'd be a, that, would, that would actually what be, a, be a cool group. Oh yeah, warrior woman says beard game strong. Yes, yeah, so true. So I think she's, comment, she's I commenting think she's on your beard in game. Our society. She she follows. I recognize the name. Yeah. Yo, what's happening? Uh, Hamid says uh, you can kill you can kill two thousand Baghdadis. Says you can. Oh, you're wow. welcome. You're welcome over here. We are live. We've got about uh, 1,400 plus people live here. Uh, this is Greg Kokel, ladies and gentlemen. He's coming out with a new edition of his uh, book, Tactics. Just so you know, um, people ask me all the time, David, I want to get involved in apologetics. What would you recommend I read? And I would say, um, well, it kind of depends on what you want to do, whether you're interested in dealing with um, atheist objections or Muslim arguments or defending the gospel or what but everyone should read tactics that's the one rec that's the one book I, I recommend everyone reads um, and he's coming out with the new edition which I'm looking forward to forward to checking out November 26th November 26th ladies and gentlemen mark your calendars I'll, I'll, I'll do a review but if it if, if the if the stuff you added is garbage I'm just gonna tell people it's garbage just so <laughs> you know right. all right that's all right For, 40 40 percent new garbage <laughs> six new garbage chapters all right, we're, we're all going to check it out. Uh, Hamid here says, uh, you can kill 2,000 Baghdadis, but if you don't treat the root cause of the problem, which is Islam, you haven't achieved anything. So this is, I mean, this is something I've been talking about for years, right? I mean, he's, he's absolutely correct here, right? You have to deal with the ideology. Um, the, the, the government, the military can go in and take out some guy who's, uh, who's using the ideology and doing something with the ide ideology, following the ideology, but if the ideology persists, um, then there, there's going to, put it this way, there are going to be more Bag al-Baghdadis. Different name, same type of guy. There's going to be more until we deal with the ideology. Well, the ideology, dealing with the ideology, yes, you need police stopping you know, people who are showing up to, to shoot people. You need the military going in and killing people like al-Baghdadi. But you need apologists and polemicists who are dealing with the ideology refuting the ideology because at the, at the end of the day that's how you that's how you have to stop it in the long run you can you can stop terrorists and terrorist groups in the short term if you want to stop them in the long term uh, you have to ultimately deal with the ideology what are you guys thoughts yeah but, oh, but that was I profound, profound wasn't it? <laughs> that was profound. You're welcome. I'm <laughs> clearly, David's I very lucky to have us. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that you haven't achieved anything, though. I mean, yeah. those are, no, 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 no. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the implication with the two thousand Baghdadis, I, I, I think that what they're suggesting are these, these are bad dudes. Uh, it's two thousand yeah. less bad dudes uh, that are going to try and kill. And you. now nine thousand kids want to grow up and avenge their father's death because <clears> they didn't <throat> understand they were on the wrong side of an ideological war. I get it. You're, yes, uh, fantastic. I think you're right. You do have to deal uh, with the root cause. I wonder what effect YouTube, social media, and the fact that some of these Middle Eastern countries now, are, you know, are, are getting access to this and free information, where it's going to be harder and harder. And this may be the linchpin. This may be one of the things that really takes down a lot of the crazy radical Islamic zealotry. Is kind of the social media stuff. Like they grow up chatting with people across the ocean who look different than them mm. and believe different they find out they're not so bad mm. like my you know captain crazy isis leader was telling me so perhaps that'll be something to to blunt the you know potent drink of radicalism they've been sipping on since they were fetuses and and yeah part part of the rise of i mean part of the oh my goodness I mean, what, what am I expecting? I'm in an airport, right? Obviously, they're going to do announcements, right? But if we're trying to do a live stream here. 
Could you guys hold it down, turn it down a little bit? Read your super chat, this dude. Any chance for collaboration? Attention, please, this is the last call for what the chat then You gotta read those. When they give you money, you gotta read them. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, normally normally I would, but um, I normally have another laptop open okay. where I'm watching, and then I can read I can read the comments over there because uh, I because I have all of this stuff for this program over here. you got here. a lot of stuff. What is this? This is Tetris and Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> this is... I was trying yeah, to so, think of more video games, and I don't know any. Yeah, so, uh, Amit, uh, Amit uh, uh, Chad's absolutely right. Uh, it, it's not that you haven't achieved anything. You can obviously achieve all kinds of things. And, right, I mean, if someone's showing up, if someone is showing up to blow up your family and a cop stops him, you don't want to say, you've achieved nothing. No, he, he's saved a bunch of lives, right? So uh, these are very important. But you're right in the sense of points, it's just gonna it's just going to keep going on and on and on until we deal with the ideology. Now look at what we have here. Something interesting happens whenever we talk about what Islam teaches or jihad or something like that. Someone has to jump in there and try to twist something into saying that well, Islam. Te I mean, well, Christianity teaches the same thing. So here we have Jesus said, Luke nineteen twenty seven. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. And this is what happened when you're fed on a steady diet of Ahmed Didats responses to jihad. Pablo, you're either a liar, you're either a liar trying to mislead people, or you are just completely ignorant here, right? Read Luke chapter 19. That is a parable. Jesus tells a parable. He's about to go away, and he tells his followers a story about a ruler, and the ruler in this story is going away, and as the ruler goes away, People rebel against him, and he comes back, and he says, the ruler in the story says, those people who rebelled against me, bring them here and slay them before me. Why are you telling us that this is what Jesus is saying to his followers? Right? Now, to be clear, the, 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 the parable is about a future judgment, but that's, but that's, that's the Lord judging, right? At, at, the, at the judgment. This has nothing to do with, with people going around killing the enemies of Jesus. We're specifically told not to do that. Oh, it's actually a good one. Uh, yeah, so uh, notice, guys, uh, Pablo. Seriously here, when I say that the Quran says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, I say that because that's exactly what it says. Read it in context, that's exactly what it means. Read the historical background, that's exactly what it means. I'm not distorting anything. When you say, oh, but Jesus told him, hey, bring my enemies here and slay them before me, you claim to respect Jesus, and yet this is how you, teach his, this is how you treat his words. You, you deliberately try to mis misrepresent what he said. Why would you do that? How can you claim to respect Jesus when you do this? All to defend your prophet. And, and notice, we're the ones telling the truth. You're the ones trying to lie about a guy you regard as a prophet. Pretty sick stuff. Um, yeah, let's recall, Jesus said when he was talking to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, mm -hmm. lest my servants would fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, 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 the principle, guys, the principle here that we have, uh, going along with what you said, but also what you've been saying earlier, is... You, as a Christian, are not to go out and, and kill people for Jesus or to kill the enemies of Jesus, right? We're not, we're not killing al-Baghdadi because he's not a Christian or something like that. We're not doing that, right? Um, if there was ever a time in all of history where it, would, where it would have been appropriate to really crack down on Jesus' enemies, it's when, it's when the soldiers came to capture him, right? And Peter tried that. He pulled out a sword, took a swing. What did Jesus say? Put your sword back into its place. Those who live by the sword die by the sword, right? So you are not to kill, go around killing for Jesus. Pablo just tried to make us all think that he was. Um, so that's one thing. On the other hand, you have governments. Governments are supposed to protect people. Governments are supposed to go and take out people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, not, not going around killing to establish Christianity or something like that, but justice, justice, human rights, and protection. All right. Got some thoughts here? Thoughts on anything so far? I like what you said. You should you should do this like on a bigger scale somewhere. Oh yeah? Yeah. You should do this professionally. <laughs> no. It's a joke. You just didn't get it the first time. Oh, yeah. One, because it wasn't a very good joke and 
He's been he's been messing with me uh, the entire week here because I kept coming to him with situations. I jump up behind him on the bus and you know, uh, no. I, so I've got him around the throat and he, I say, "Hey, what do you do? He what did do you not do here?" Do that. He didn't touch me. I say, "What do you do?" And he said, "I would just do whatever the person tells me to do." What's what's bad is he's like really he doesn't realize how pessimistic he is. I'm like, "Okay, a guy runs up in the room, gun pointed at you." What do you do? He's like, well, if, if he shoots, I'm going to die. I'm like, gosh, man, what do you know? You're supposed to charge him or no. roll or zigzag or something. Check it out. I'm not living out a movie. So don't, don't feel like, what, well, you got to Liam Neeson and do an aerial backflip, kick the gun out of his hand, catch it, and shoot him in the balls. You know, kind of like, yeah. you know, it's, it's not the thing. It, it, violence is, is, is different in real life. And so here, our tier one operators wear body armor. You got it? Yeah. Because if you want to play with guns, if you want to fight, you're, you may very well get shot. It's it's brutal. It's unforgiving. It's savage. It's up close. It's personal. It's very fat. And the, even if you have an incredibly high degree of training, you can still get waxed because it was just, hey, wrong place, wrong time. Make sure your prayer game's on point because stuff can go sideways. Mm -hmm. And so you, you said, you start, it was the context to my defense of pessimistic. He said, all right, so in the first episode of Dexter, which I haven't seen, uh, Dexter's like behind the driver and he has a wire and he puts it over the guy's head and tightens it down and says, you're mine. And he's like, what would you do with that? And I'm like, well, I would do what he said because he's right. You're totally hit. There's nothing you can do anymore. I, I came up with a, suggestions like slamming the seat backwards no. into him, and he said that. Nope, now, that would you, work. You did, Zero say, percent. you did say two possibilities. One, if you had a gun. That, yes, that would if help. you had a gun, now you can shoot him, and the only way he can stop you is if he takes hand off wire. Mm -hmm. So you're digging right here trying to fish with a gun, and you just, hey, just hope you hit something. That's one and two. If you are actively driving, then you just smash into something as hard as you can and it's and better it's better to mess yourself up in an accident than to, than yeah, to yeah, die there yeah yeah at least you got a shot immediately i thought of oh wreck the car mm -hmm. uh, but, right yeah, that is a solution yeah. that might work but seat back or ninja whatever weird ninja <laughs> kick flip you had in your head that's not gonna work <laughs> No, see, I, yeah, I come up with, with plans all the time, but that's when I actually didn't have anything for. Right? That's because there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, just in trouble. And, and this is the martial artist in me speaking, sometimes the answer to how do you get out of that move is don't get in it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So check your back seat. Check your back seat, bro. All right, all right. Um, all right, we'll probably go for a few more minutes here. I might take a few more comments. Um, how, how does this work, by the way? So you guys go, you guys go through training and stuff like that. Once you've gone through training, do they just immediately like send you out somewhere? I've been a little do? chatty. I'd like Chad to start. All right. Yeah, the pipelines are obviously different. So uh, when you go through SEAL training, after you've made it through boot camp, and now they don't even have them go through an A school. Uh, they just go straight over to BUDS if they have a contract. Uh, after BUDS, you'll go on to SQT, do cold weather training out in Alaska. Uh, you learn how to do uh, static line jumps and then free fall and then you get placed on a team and if you get placed on a team that's currently deployed then you're deploying immediately with that team you jump in with that team wherever they're at in their their workup their process even and if they were going after someone like Baghdadi or something jumping right in a new guy on the team probably wouldn't be going out on that operation mm -hmm. he'd probably be back at like the tactical operation command you know He'd be the water boy, you know, mm -hmm. getting stuff together for the guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would deploy if that's where his team's at. He's going to be out there with them. By the way, you 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 were telling me a story that's like messed up about how how savage the guys who are training you are. Total story. I didn't. Well, I don't know if you want to share the story in public, but you want to share a story about a guy breaking his leg during training? Oh, uh, sure. Okay, right, cool. We're, we're there. I didn't know so, if you wanted to, but. Uh, while I was going through BUDS, our boat crews were doing some races and we're climbing up these ropes. And I was the last guy in my boat crew, the anchor man, and I was going against another anchor man. And uh, I was racing this guy up the rope and we're probably about 30 feet high and that rope is all wet and sandy and I was gaining on him. And, uh, you know, it looked like I'm, I got him. I'm going to mm -hmm. beat him. And so it pays to be a winner in training. And so he's doing the best he can to try and beat me. And, and really who wins is not who gets to the top first, but who gets down to the bottom. Uh, but I feel pretty confident I got him. Uh, well, he lost his grip trying to go too fast. We locked eyes for one moment as he just kind of gave me this look like I'm burning in. And, and he goes burning in and falls about 25 feet. And when he hit the ground, you can hear and see uh, that leg snap and break. Oh. And so uh, it's pointing in a different direction now. And he is just 
screaming in, in pain. I can't even imagine how bad that hurt. And you would think now maybe the instructors will snap out of whatever role they're playing, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they might say, are you okay? Can we help you? What hurts? Instead, they stand over the top of him as this guy's screaming in pain and they're yelling at him, suffer in silence. Just screaming, suffer in silence. And I'm hanging onto the <laughs> rope. You cry, baby. Realizing like, these guys have no mercy. Yeah. And then I begin to think, did he win? I think he beat me to the bottom. Right? I think he deserved the win, <laughs> yep, too. You deserve, the win. Don't you take it away. <laughs> you're sitting you're seriously <laughs> wondering if you won or not? Because that dude's hobbling around still. Yeah, know, like, unfortunately. But I beat him, son. The, he, I beat he him. Won. He won. He won. He deserved he the win. Yep. And, uh, but by the way, there, there's there's a reason. There's actually a good reason for that. The the, the idea that, hey, I don't, I don't care if you break your leg, you keep your mouth shut. What would the good reason for that be? Because uh, in combat, you know, if you get shot or injured and you're screaming and giving away your position, not suffering in, in silence, you're, that's exactly what you're doing. You're giving away the position of uh, your teammates. And so the instructor's on the fly right there. I mean, that wasn't part of the curriculum of the day, uh, but they, they picked right up on it. These were guys who were just, you know, fresh right out of the Iraq war. And so they had some real life examples to be teaching us right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, show no weakness ever. <laughs> That's the environment you signed up for. Every day is an audition for your own job that you already got. It's yeah. not like, eh, I made it a percent. We're good. It's like, no, every single day you have a bad day. Now you're a dirt bag and you get fired. <laughs> yeah. Attention, please, allow passengers on flight zero to We are pausing, obviously, because of the we can try and talk over him. Just talk really, really loud. Probably be fine. Um, is he going to do the English now? So, or my warrior it? poet crew, I see you all in the comments. Thanks so much. Good. Glad you found me. Good to see you guys. Welcome. Yeah, warrior poet crew. We know what you guys love. <laughs> Guns. <laughs> It's like there's, it's like there's two of us, oh, man. You just nailed it. Perfect. You, you sure you didn't do my job before you're doing this? That was awesome. Um, uh, MB3 said, my favorite verse of the Quran is 5:47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed to them. Uh, whosoever does not follow this law is defiantly disobedient and evil doers. Uh, don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Uh, most your average Muslim doesn't know. Uh, the Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. That's Why awesome. is that interesting? Well, your average Muslim thinks, oh, oh no, our books have been corrupted. Not what Allah says. If our books have been corrupted, Allah does not know it, and Muslims would have to know more than Allah. Uh, but why this is relevant, why this is relevant is if the gospel is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, as the Quran says, then... Well, Muslims have a kind of dilemma on their hands, since that's what the Quran says, right? Because uh, either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. It's one or the other, right? If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false, because it says we have it, right? So, if we have the word of God, Islam is false, because Islam contradicts what we have, if we don't have the word of God, Islam is false because Islam affirms what we have. So either way, Islam is false, right? So that's why it's important to uh, learn passages like chapter 5, verse 47. But guys, um, the Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the gospel, the Injil. And from the second century to, through the time of Muhammad, if they were referring to a book as the gospel, right? Because we refer to the gospels, but when, for, from the second century on, they referred to the four gospels as the fourfold gospel. So they would refer to it as, as singular, right? The, go the gospel. So if you're preaching, you're preaching the gospel. That's a message. If you're talking about a book during the time of Muhammad, that referred to the four gospels, treated as a unit, the fourfold gospel. So if the fourfold gospel is the word of God as the Quran claims what should Muslims be thinking about in our book that they would have to take as the word of God here well think of the implications that that implies then that the gospel is true and part of the gospel is that Jesus Christ went to the cross suffered and died for our sins was buried 
rose again from the dead, conquering the power of sin, conquering the power of death. And my understanding is, is that Muslims don't actually believe that Jesus even went to the cross at all. And so there you have historical documents. In fact, all of secular history or even Jewish history uh, and Greek Roman history would suggest that Jesus went to the cross. It's never been the debate whatsoever. But here, Muhammad and, and is... And even among scholars today, right? Even among scholars today, uh, atheist scholars, agnostic scholars, Christian scholars, Jewish scholars, everyone across the board acknowledges Jesus' death by crucifixion. And they don't just say, yeah, we kind of believe it. Uh, they say it's the, one of the best established facts of all of history. And we find it in our text. And here the Quran is affirming our text, and yet the Quran also denies that Jesus was crucified. So, uh, And you furthermore, get, you, get, the, you, you guys you see the problem? To say? Well, I was just thinking, how incredible is that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of history gets it right, you know, and they get, get it wrong. If you're really being honest and reading the Quran, and it says that, you know, Jesus never really went to the cross, I mean, be honest with yourself. Is this really a, a reliable document that you're reading here? Mm -hmm. And in the Quran, you're even going to have mention of Jesus, Islam's second highest prophet, Jesus. Uh, and here he is, perfect, and he's doing miracles. And so what is one more miracle? I mean, already the Quran is saying, Jesus did miracles. What's one more miracle is rising again. And we have this as a well-established historical fact. Think about it. The year is 2019 right now because some dude split time in two. You should investigate that. What what happened that was so profound that time was split in two and, now, and then went, went on to have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people martyred because they believed that Jesus rose again. So, yeah, let's let's look into Jesus more. Um, and once again, for those of you who are just tuning in, because more and more people keep tuning in, and um, we are we are we are live from Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel. We're about to head back to the U.S. after um, after touring for a little while, um, but uh, we saw an opportunity to go live, and so we decided to go live for about an hour. We're going to go for about another uh, twelve or thirteen minutes. Um, Good, because we're boarding in 12 or 13 minutes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chad! Say something smart. No. Chad! Uh, for the first few days, I didn't realize you were actually funny until I, I sat out with you. And Chad would start out discussions like, I remember this one time I had to choke this dude out. <laughs> while doing street evangelism. <laughs> Let me tell us how something like that would happen. Yeah, I was at this conference. It was an evangelism conference uh, called Deeper out in Kentucky. Um, Living Waters was putting it on. Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron and a lot of other guys were over there teaching. And uh, at the end of the conference, I think a lot of people were feeling inspired to go out and actually evangelize. And so they looked at places to go and they found this beer fest that was going on. And they thought it would be a good idea to go do some open air preaching at a at a beer fest, where, you know, I immediately saw that that's that's not a good idea at all, right there. You know, they thought that they're going to sober people up with the Holy Spirit, and I just knew this is going to end in in violence. But I decided I'm going to go along with them. I don't want to partake in this, but I want to protect them at least to whatever level I can. I want to be their eyes and ears. I want to look out for them in case someone needs to get choked out. So I'm there to protect them, and. Uh, <laughs> We get there, long story short, um, they were all scared to get started. And so they asked me if I would kick things off and do some open air preaching. So I hop up on a bench and I go ahead and start doing a little open air. And I got this flood lamp that's in my eyes and I can't really see the crowd, but I, I can hear them. I know they're out there and they're yelling and cursing at me. And I'm thinking I'm going to get a, a beer bottle just thrown right at my face. I'm never going to see it coming. But I start to make that pivot, the turn from the law to the gospel. So now I'm preaching the good news and the love of Jesus and what he did up at the cross. And uh, right then, one of the guys with me that I will leave unnamed, uh, he ran up to me and he asked for my wallet. And I thought he was asking for my wallet uh, because my voice was getting pretty dry. And I thought, that's pretty nice of him. He's going to use my money to go get me uh, a water real quick. As it turns out, what it really was is he wanted to get my identification. So I was on terminal leave at the time, so I wasn't even completely out of the teams yet. And so I still had my, my team card, and he knew that. And what it was going on, he was arguing with a, a guy in the crowd over whether or not I really was a Navy SEAL. Apparently he told the guy, that guy up there is a Navy SEAL. That guy's like, no, he's not. 
And so he tries to get my ID to show him though he really is. Why didn't you just show him one of your autobiographies? It wasn't out yet. Oh, uh, gotcha. <laughs> Seals always write books, so I have to... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. All right. So this guy ends up grabbing my ID. And I don't even know what's going on. And so I see, you know, one of the dudes that I'm with, he's hanging on to somebody by their fingertips and yelling to me, Chad, Chad. And I'm thinking, why is he being the aggressor and hanging on to this guy? He's just trying to get away from him. The guy breaks his grip, takes off through the crowd, and that's when he yells out to me, uh, that guy has your, your military ID. And so I'm like right in the middle of preaching the cross, and now I'm, boom, like a Malinois going through the crowd and uh, square up with the guy and uh, end up catching him in a rear naked choke hold. And he had my ID still, and he wouldn't let it go. And so he was trying to That's destroy dedication. it in his hands. And so now I decide, okay, it's time to put on the anaconda squeeze. And so I'm squeezing. Anaconda squeeze. And, uh, you I got my neck, but I'm going to crush your ID. <laughs> I let him down as he let go of my ID. I grab my ID. I look up. He's got a couple pals there that are all bark, no bite. They're not going to fight. But I had this big beer fest crowd going on because there's a fight, fight, fight going on. And there's this sort of this awkward moment where I'm standing there. This guy's laid out. I was just preaching Jesus. And uh, a dude just goes, yeah, choking people out for Jesus. And the whole crowd's choking people out for Jesus. And I was like, I got to get out of here. And right then the yellow jackets, the police were making their way through. And I bolted out of there. So choke people out for Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes it's what you got to do. I wanted to tell that story cause, because it's kind of it's kind of related. You know what I mean? Right, a it's it's bit. a it's a it's a it's a smaller it's a smaller example of you know the same situation with El Baghdadi. Sometimes you have to sure, protect yeah. people, and you know one guy, he's he's taking your ID, so you might have to just choke him out. Whereas the other guy's mass murdering and raping tons of people, and so yeah, more more extreme and that's methods. That's the compressed version of it. You know, I wasn't just gonna go right off and choke him out, but he wouldn't let go, and he wouldn't give my property back. Hey. Play stupid so. games, win stupid prizes. <laughs> he he earned it. That's, that's awesome. well done. That's how it works. Well, uh, uh, I actually have a good one here. Check this out. What do you think about Trump's reaction about the killing of the ISIS leader? Um, now, I'll say, uh, in general, I don't like politicians and leaders. It's mainly uh, a situation where I think that in order to have really awesome leaders you need an awesome population of really well informed people who are going to to vote for uh vote for the right leaders and so with leaders it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis i say okay i agree with him on this 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 and this uh this 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 and this i think he messed up or he, he or she messed up or something like that so that's how kind of how i am with leaders with all of that said I thought Trump's reaction was hilarious. <laughs> That's what what do you guys think about it when he was like, uh, uh, I don't know what he said because I only read it, but it, it, it was like uh, he went out like a dog. The dogs came after him. Uh, he was crying, whimpering like a baby in a cave, uh, surrounded by children. Uh, so he was kind of like that yeah. and just, just completely mocking this guy. But um, what do you think? What do you, is it appropriate? Uh, a little more than appropriate. I think awesome. Maybe maybe the technical mm -hmm. word would be awesome, and awesome. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for the people to understand, you know, the Islamic State. That yeah, your leader was a coward. That's really what he was at the end of the day. He died like a dog. They can't like stand dogs. They can't stand, you know, dogs especially. Chased right? by dogs and uh, died like a dog. That's the only thing they respect: is brute force and strength. Wow. Little different than bowing down to their leaders. And what what's amazing? I mean, I don't know. I mean, how serious this is. This isn't some random leader. This is a this is supposedly the caliph of the revived caliphate, right? Um, Islam for thirteen centuries had a had a caliphate. Then it fell apart after the the Ottoman Empire. The goal here was to reestablish it. This is the guy. This is the new guy, right? Yeah. This is this is the revived caliphate. He's the new Abu Bakr, and he dies squealing like a pig. There is, you know, other than hey, that's pretty hardcore way to go, Trump. I think there is an important propaganda piece. Yeah, it's kind of like when we're and talking the, about and that's all the main this. reason I like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it 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 looks just calloused and insensitive to people. Like, no, there's something very specific that's happening from a propaganda standpoint that is helpful in actually winning a war and saving innocent lives. So you may not like the language, but there's a lot we don't like. We don't like 
what he was doing in the first place. <laughs> we don't like that we have to go across the ocean to kill bad guys because they came across the ocean to kill ours first. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Cowards don't inspire people. No. Right? And shameful deaths don't either. And so if you make it shameful to be a terrorist, if you make it unattractive, same thing with active killers, guys. Uh, if we romanticize plastering the active killer bios and last manifestos all throughout the news, we kind of immortalize them, just as like we look, we think about different dead presidents, and there's Lee Harvey Oswald right behind, right beside, and you know, forever enshrined beside him. And so, some of these just real sick folks that go on these active killer rampages. One of the best things we can do is glorify the person that killed them, but make them look kind of stupid and, and pathetic and cowardly and weak. And uh, that can help stop the inciting and the copycat crimes that are actually happening. A lot of it is being perpetrated more and more through social media and the news network, especially the news networks. Don't say their names. Don't make them heroes. Yeah, um, here's a comment. I'm assuming this is a joke because we do have a... Uh, we do have people posting uh, comments, comments trying to be funny. Yeah. That's a joke. Yeah. He says, El Baghdadi still won at the end of the day. He got his, he got 72 virgins. Um, what's the, the reason I, the reason I went ahead and, and clicked on this, even, even if it's a joke is that is what Islam teaches. That is what Islam teaches. And just so you know, the 72 number, that's the minimum. That's what you get. If you're just average, if you're world-class, you get way more. And um, Allah promises because the, the the question arose. Well, how are you know how are guys going to keep having sex and deflowering all these girls for all eternity? And the response, the teaching of Allah through Muhammad, was that Allah will give guys miraculously preserved erections so that they can keep doing it over and over and over. You're back there smiling, right? You're back there smiling. Sounds this ridiculous. Is, this is what it te this is what it teaches, right? And then you've got guys, um, then you've got guys going and, 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 and doing what Al Baghdadi did, did because uh, they they believe this stuff. And so, guys, uh, Muslims who are Muslims who are watching here, um, do you actually believe that Al Baghdadi is uh, is on his way to get his virgins? Uh, because of all the stuff he did, because of all the raping and killing he did, or maybe just all the parts of him. Yeah, because it, guess what? If you say no, you've got a problem because the early leaders of Islam acted the same way. They didn't have the same technology that people have nowadays. They didn't have the guns and stuff. But as far as the way they treated female captives and things like that, they were doing the same thing. So you got a problem if you think this guy is totally out of line and he's not making it and he's evil. You need to look back to your prophet and the original uh, rightly guided Kalos. All right, guys, we have a, uh, what do we got? We need to get to our gate because yeah, we, uh, we don't want to be late. So uh, final two minutes here. Why don't you guys go both uh, uh, give any final thoughts, uh, tell people again where to find you because we, we do have new people coming in. Uh, you know, final thoughts is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, here's what life is really all about. Uh, not some false incentive, you know, going and trying to find, you know, 72 virgins by uh, clacking off a button. Uh, we were created. We're human beings, and we know there's something bigger, something greater out there, uh, and that is God. And what separates us from the Creator are our sins. Our sins have separated us from the Creator, and there's nothing we could do about our own sins. This is a problem that uh, the, the God of Islam cannot solve. If God is truly just, uh, that means he's not going to let a crime go unpunished. If he's merciful, that means that he's going to let people off for crimes they deserve to be punished for. So there's an apparent contradiction there. How is, on the one hand, God just, not letting a single crime go unpunished, and merciful, letting people offer crimes that they deserve to be punished for? The only solution is at the cross, where God's justice is unleashed on Jesus, who pays for our crimes in full at the cross, so that God can show us mercy. So there's no solution outside of the cross. And the way that we receive that gift that He freely offers us is just by repenting of our sin and placing our faith and trust in Him as our Savior, our Savior, because that's what He does saves us from our sin and our Lord because he's our assault leader he's the one that's going to be uh, the shot caller inform us how we ought to live our lives all right where can they find you uh, fantastic thank you that's great
So uh, on Instagram, my handle is the same as the book title, Seal of God. And uh, again, on YouTube, Divine Sabotage. And one of the last questions I answered on there is, can a Christian serve in the military? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, I won't add any closing thoughts because I like Chad so much. I'll just say I'm John Lovell, Warrior Poet Society. Type Warrior Poet in anywhere, um, Instagram or YouTube, and you'll find us. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us here live from Tel Aviv. The links to uh, uh, the links to John's channel and uh, Chad's book, and I'll add some other links once I get more information on where these guys go. But the links will be in the description box. Thanks all for right. having us on, man. Yeah. Catch you all next time.